Although two Nixon appointees said no, the seven other members of the Supreme Court today ruled that the American people own Richard Nixon's White House tapes and White House documents. Eyewitness News at noon with Bill Burns and Patty Burns. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eleanor Shano. Both Bill and Patty are off this week. In the news at this hour, today's decision is a victory for the government, which has fought for more than three years to gain control of the nearly 5,000 hours of tapes and 42 million documents of the Nixon presidency. Nixon's attorneys had argued that the papers and tapes belonged to him because of executive privilege. But the court ruled that executive privilege exists to protect the republic and not the president. Archivists will now sift through the mountains of material to determine which is purely personal and can be returned to the former president and what can now be made public. Chief Justice Warren Burger and Justice William Rehnquist, both Nixon appointees to the court, dissented. Meanwhile, in Harrisburg today, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania still doesn't have a state budget, but the legislators have eliminated several possibilities. Late last night, members of the House rejected a proposal for a no-tax increase budget. They also turned down another bill that would have raised the state's personal income tax from 2% to 2.3.5%. After the failure of both measures, State House Speaker Kay Leroy Irvis of the Hill District commented, Quote, this is the worst fiscal mess we've ever been in. Irvis has been a member of the Pennsylvania State Legislature for more than 20 years. Senate Democrats in Harrisburg rejected a Republican proposal last night to fully fund the State Crime Commission until a new budget passes the legislature. Democrats refused to add $112,000 to a stopgap bill, which would have allowed the state to spend money after June 30th. The measure, with the Crime Commission funding linked to it, failed by a vote of 26 to 21. And a second stopgap funding proposal without the Crime Commission section passed overwhelmingly. It would fund state welfare and medical assistance payments until a complete budget is passed. Well, in other news, the State Public Utility Commission will be meeting today to try to determine how much natural gas will be available next winter. Although the federal government has warned of even more shortages than last winter, four Pennsylvania utilities have predicted that they'll have more than enough gas available next winter, certainly more than they did during the last season. State Senator Franklin Curry of Sanbury, Pennsylvania, wants to end the fuel adjustment charge on gas and utility bills. Now, Curry says that utilities should submit increases in the uh, fuel price when they apply for rate increases before the Public Utility Commission. Under current law, utilities can raise the fuel adjustment charge without permission from the PUC. The fuel adjustment charge is used to compensate the utility's higher cost for the price they pay for fuel. Residents of Sewickley have petitioned PennDOT and the state legislators to speed up plans to replace the Sewickley Bridge. Although PennDOT plans to finish the project for a new bridge in 1979, those in Sewickley say that's not soon enough. A recent announcement that PennDOT was going to spend $9 million to replace the old Sewickley Bridge did little to quiet the fears of the people who live and do business in and around Sewickley. PennDOT says plans for a new bridge will be completed during the latter part of next year. But people who live in the Sewickley, Coriopolis, Moon Township area say that's not soon enough. I discussed the problem with PennDOT's district engineer, Anthony Gata, and Sewickley Mayor, Bill Gorley. And we're concerned with another severe winter, the bridge might be closed this January in spite of the temporary repairs. And if that's the case, it would mean an additional year without the bridge. And that concerns us immensely. It would hurt the, uh, the economy of Swickley? It would not only hurt the economy of Sewickley, but that of Moon Township and Coriopolis and some 24 other communities that are involved. And probably most critical, it would shut off the Coriopolis Moon Township area from the Sewickley Hospital. You can't wave a magic wand and have a bridge completely re rehabilitated or replaced. And uh, sure, there's inconvenience. We went in an emergency contract to hold that bridge here on a temporary basis while we complete design. But you can't have your cake and eat it, too. A good example is the parkway. Want to make the parkway safer? You're going to be inconvenienced while the work's being done. Last year, the Sewickley Bridge literally began falling apart. PennDOT came in and made repairs. Those repairs are supposed to last for from 18 months to two years. The new bridge is supposed to be up sometime in 1979. But the people who live out here think PennDOT's time schedule may be cutting things just a bit too close. Ron Olson, Eyewitness News, Soikley. 
Swickley Bridge isn't the only serious bridge problem PennDOT is facing. Tony Gata, PennDOT district engineer, says the combination of bridge repairs and road repairs will mean a need for additional funding for PennDOT. Money, but it's almost too late. Bridges are going to continue to be posted and closed down when they're unsafe, and we want to think about the uh, energy panel at Seven Springs are concerned about energy. Bridges are directly related to conservation of energy. Long detours, uh, additional cost to industry to get their raw materials and ship their finished products out. Uh, whether they can be competitive with the business in another part of the country. Uh, the additional cost to the taxpayers, the additional money the school boards have to put out to detour school buses because bridges can't take the school buses. Now, even if PennDOT can get additional money, Gata says that red tape is a major problem. For instance, if Congress were to make $500 million available today, Gata predicts that it would take three to five years before PennDOT could really use the money for construction. 20-year-old Jeanette Reed of Bentley Drive in the Hill District was held over this morning on a general charge of involuntary manslaughter in the death of her eight-month-old daughter. Ramona Reed died on June 15th in Children's Hospital about 40 minutes after she was taken to the hospital by her aunt. The child was allegedly beaten to death. A date for a trial has not yet been set. Well, Streets Run Road had to be closed to traffic today. It was closed this morning from Brentwood Road to Hayes because of a water main break. The break created a large ditch in the area which had to be filled. Now, the break happened about 5.30 this morning, but the road was shut off about two hours later. However, traffic is now moving again on Streets Run Road. A suspended employee of the Patch Rubber Company was charged yesterday with vandalism and breaking and entering in connection with last week's explosion in Akron, Ohio. 18-year-old Dale Goddard was suspended two days before Teamsters Local 348 went on strike. That explosion occurred after a chemical spill had closed the plant in Akron sewer lines. Well, at least three persons were injured this morning when a truck skidded on the wet pavement on the Pennsylvania Turnpike near Hampton Township and hit a car. Gibsonia State Police say the car, after being hit, spun around, came to rest, and then burst into flames. The owner of the car, 18-year-old James Wagner of Bell Street, that's in Evans City, is being treated today at North Hills Passive and Hospital. The truck driver, 28-year-old Larry Broadwater of Uniontown, and his son, 13-year-old Kevin from Rockwood, Pennsylvania, were both treated at Passivant for injuries. An electrical fire caused considerable damage to a shopping center in Waynesburg last night. That story is next on Eyewitness News. There's a lot to do at Kennywood. Come on and ride, ride, ride. Lots of things are new at See Batman and Robin in person this Sunday and Monday. And remember, this Saturday through July 8th are one price days at Kennywood. This is Tony Randall. I'll be co-host on the next Mike Douglas show, featuring the talents of animal trainer Gunter Gebel Williams. Come here, Princey. Sit small. Sit small. Sit small. Sit small. And the singing of Helen Schneider. Join us and let Mike make your day. Join Mike and co-host Tony Randall today at 4 on TV2. Leonard Nimoy is your host for a look into the world of the unknown. Join TV2 tonight at 7.30 as we go in search on. Tonight at 7.30 on TV2.
faulty electrical wiring is being blamed today for a fire last night in the Hillcrest Mall. It's in Waynesburg. Firemen said that all 14 shops in the mall were engulfed by smoke. Damages will run at least $20,000 in the blaze. Waynesburg volunteer firemen had to be treated for smoke inhalation. That is, two Waynesburg firemen were treated. It took firemen three and a half hours to control the fire last night. Bethlehem Mine Company officials have rediscovered a coal mine fire which began in the uh, number 32 portal near Revlock in Cambria County. The fire was uncovered while workmen were draining 120 million gallons of water. Now, that water had poured into the mine to put out the February blaze. About 300 miners who work in number 32 portal are now idle. Bethlehem Mine officials say it will take several weeks to put the fire out. Well, the president of the Indiana County Mental Health Association has called for an investigation of Torrance State Hospital in Westmoreland County. Dr. Gordon Thornton asked State Welfare Secretary Frank Beal for the probe after the death of 45-year-old Raymond, Raymond uh, Patternay. He's a, he was a patient at Torrance for 24 years. Patternay's aunt, Mrs. Ann Harvey of Homer City, says Patternay had been drugged and heavily bruised at the time of his death. The Philadelphia Inquirer reports today that Governor Schaap's patronage chief, Sam Begler, and Allegheny County State Representative Charles Caputo are the subject of a federal investigation. Now, according to the Inquirer, the probe involves alleged contracts by the State Liquor Control Board to rent warehouses in Lebanon and in Erie, Pennsylvania. The State Justice Department last year dropped investigations into both contracts. Federal authorities will be checking charges that Begler and Caputo may have been involved in kickbacks on liquor warehouse contracts. Well, Bill Hill, the head of the National Independent Truckers Unity Council, has called for a 48-hour national holiday to gain relief for independent truck drivers. Hill wants Congress to permit independent truckers to negotiate their own wage contracts. The 48-hour shutdown is scheduled to begin at midnight this Thursday. Hill's organization represents 26 trucking firms and about 100,000 other truck owner operators. Well, if gasoline supplies suddenly become tight, President Carter wants to be able to ration gasoline and ration it quickly. Now, energy aides to the president say Mr. Carter has asked for a review of fuel rationing plans just in case there is a supply interruption, such as the Arab oil embargo a few years ago. Such a plan would give the White House broad powers over the control of gasoline and other energy supplies. The NAACP today hailed the Supreme Court's support of improved education as a cure for illegal race discrimination in schools. The High Court ruled that a trial judge has the authority to order a wide range of special education programs to overcome the effects of past discrimination. And NAACP General Counsel Nathaniel Jones commented on that court ruling. Desegregation means more than mere pupil reassignment, mere body shuffling. It means that in order to overcome the vestiges of the, of, the, of the harm that's been done, the vestiges of the segregation, the state has to get involved in dealing with quality education. And that means that the black youngsters who are involved in desegregation can be assured of not being isolated once they move into a desegregated setting. And the tracking and all of these little techniques that have been used by some school districts to resegregate inside of the desegregated buildings uh, cannot uh, take root. We have a story just into our eyewitness newsroom. At least one person is reported dead. A tractor trailer has plunged off the uh, Boulevard of the Allies onto Second Avenue. Our reporter Bob Sprague is on the scene. We have him on the phone right now. What is the story, Bob? Eleanor, I'm at 622 Second Avenue, about half a block away from the scene where Rescuers from the Emergency Medical Service and the Pittsburgh Fire Department are trying frantically to saw through the twisted wreckage of an automobile carrier, which apparently skidded on somewhere near the approach on the Boulevard of the Allies to the Liberty Bridge, and as you said, plunged at least 50 feet from that uh, expressway down onto Second Avenue upside down. At least two people are in the cab, possibly three. One is apparently dead. The uh, condition of the other is unknown and the rescuers will not know until they can uh, cut through the cab and try to determine exactly how many people were in there. 
one uh, eyewitness who said he saw the uh, the uh, truck go off said uh, he was working on the fifth floor of the building right there at 703 Second Avenue when he heard a screeching sound looked up and saw the rear end of the uh, tractor trailer coming over first and then the uh, truck apparently just kept on sliding and plunged to the pavement and above Second Avenue is divided on either side of the Boulevard of the Allies uh, which is it uh, the inbound or outbound uh side of Second Avenue where this accident occurred? Well, at this particular uh, moment, uh, Second Avenue is a two-way street. It does not really divide until it gets on down to the 10th Street Bridge. Uh, is this near the Public Safety Building or this on the other right side? right between the Public Safety Building and the 10th Street Bridge where Second Avenue crosses underneath the Liberty Bridge approaches. Mm -hmm. the, what is the traffic situation out there now? Well, as you can imagine, uh, traffic has been detoured around. This portion of Second Avenue is closed to traffic. The uh, Port Authority has rerouted buses around the area. There are uh, quite a few spectators watching silently to see uh, exactly what's going to happen. It uh, certainly was a very dramatic and very tragic accident, and it will be some time yet, I think, before the rescuers can determine just how many victims were in that cab. Uh, we could see two, but there are reports that there might have been a third mm -hmm. uh, trapped underneath, and of course that's what the rescuers are now frantically trying to do, is to, is to free them and get an extent, uh, if any, if, uh, of the injuries and uh, how many fatalities there may have been. Okay, Bob, thank you very much for that eyewitness report. Bob Sprague on the scene of a very bad accident at 2nd Avenue and the Boulevard of the Allies. The accident just occurred within the past hour. At least one person is known dead. We'll have a complete report on the news at 6 o'clock. Well, in other news, Food and Drug Administration Com Commissioner Donald Kennedy said yesterday that the proposed ban on saccharin could be made even stronger. In testimony before a House committee, Kennedy made these comments. California Democrat Henry Waxman said the proposed saccharin ban has generated more public protest to Congress than any issue with the exception of former President Nixon's so-called Saturday Night Massacre. FDA Commissioner Kennedy said extending the time for comment on the ban may quiet the protest. The public debate about saccharin has sometimes ignored and frequently obscured the valid and troubling scientific evidence on which the agency's proposal was based and continues to be based, providing an additional period for the submission of comments and the continuation of discussion of the issue should permit wider public understanding of the new evidence of human risk and better appreciation of the appropriateness of the actions the agency has already proposed. Some members of Congress have criticized the Canadian study that linked saccharin to bladder cancer in males. Suburban Chicago police say they've hit a dead end in their investigation of the theft of the body of movie producer Mike Todd. A shovel found about 500 feet from the gravesite is the only clue. It was 1958. Mike Todd and Elizabeth Taylor were the glamour couple of Hollywood, and Todd the successful producer of Around the World in 80 Days. The movie was still a box office success when Todd and three others were killed in a fiery New Mexico plane crash in March of that year. And now, some 19 years later, someone has removed the contents of Mike Todd's coffin from the suburban Jewish cemetery where his remains had been buried. At least two people involved, say investigators, because the marker bearing his given name and professional name, a 300-pound stone, was carried, not pushed from the grave. And the idea of a prank has been discounted because the grave robbers erected tree branches to conceal their activities during the estimated four hours of digging. As evidence, police have the top of the coffin that was pried off and a shovel that may have been used. As a motive, police cite recent Nazi protests in the Chicago area and extortion. Uh, extortion uh, certainly is a possibility. Whether or not there's any connection with the uh, Nazi party, uh, uh, we don't know. In your mind, why would there be? Only to draw attention to their to their uh, cause. If they if if they've had any connection with us at all. Investigators say the timing of the theft is curious as well. Todd's birthday was last Wednesday. He would have been 68. Elizabeth Taylor visited the grave with flowers last Friday. So far, neither she nor any other relatives have received any extortion demands. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Forest Park, Illinois. Venezuela's president is in Washington this week for talks with President Carter. We'll have that story next when Eyewitness News continues. Nancy Hogan and Jean Horning both lost weight with prolamine. Here's what they said. 
Well, I, I tried a lot of things to lose weight, but prolamine is what did it. Prolamine makes it easier to diet because my appetite's under control. Prolamine time capsules help curb your appetite as you follow the low-calorie diet plan to take weight off. It really works. Prolamine time capsules and diet plan to help you take weight off. Available at Revco. Look at them go, Price. Our quick getaway gang at A&P keeps the checkout lanes moving fast. Right, Pride. We're saving A&P shoppers time because we've added hundreds of service people to quickly and carefully pack all purchases. That gets you on your way without delay. Pittsburgh area shoppers won't be wasting time or money at A&P. New York strip steaks cut from western grain-fed beef with bone-in only $1.89 a pound. And remember, at A&P, we pick the best, so you can too. President Carter will greet Venezuela's President Carlos Perez at the White House today. The two leaders began two days of talks that are expected to concentrate on oil, trade, and human rights. Perez will be honored tonight at a state dinner. Israeli leaders reportedly were astonished by comments on a Middle East settlement by the State Department yesterday. The Carter administration suggested that Israel should give up most of its occupied Arab territories without preconditions. State Department spokesman Hadi Carter had these comments. Clearly, whatever arrangements were made would have to take into account the security requirements of all the parties involved. Within the terms of Resolution 242, in return for this kind of peace, Israel should withdraw from occupied territories. We consider that this resolution means withdrawal on all fronts in the Middle East dispute. The Sinai, the Golan Heights, West Bank, Gaza, with the exact borders and security arrangements being agreed in the negotiations. These negotiations must start without any preconditions from any side. This means no territories, including the West Bank, are automatically excluded from the items to be negotiated. Meanwhile, rival Palestinian forces battled through the night in two Beirut refugee camps. Christians shelled Muslim villages in southern Lebanon near the Israeli border. Beirut hospitals report 11 dead, 30 wounded before a ceasefire this morning stopped the fighting. Spokesmen say the casualty toll will probably be higher then reported because Muslim guerrillas took most of their casualties to a Palestinian hospital that is not reporting casualties. The fighting in Lebanon is reported to be the heaviest since the civil war in that nation ended seven months ago. However, since the fighting has died down, the residents of Beirut have gotten used to sounds that are quite different from gunfire. A horn is probably the busiest part of any automobile in Beirut. It is more important than a rearview mirror when you're moving and certainly attracts more attention than any traffic light in town when you're not. The Arabs rank among the noisiest drivers in the world and the Lebanese are among the noisiest of Arabs. Add to all this the dusk to dawn din of the marketplaces in Beirut and what you've got is one of the world's most noise polluted cities. But if you ask most Lebanese, they will tell you that that is just the way they like it. During the war, this was a silent city, except for the sounds of battle. And as far as most who live here are concerned now, all the racket is the sound of life. Doug Tunnell, CBS News, Beirut. And we'll have sports, stocks, the weather, and some people in the news when Eyewitness News continues. Hills has wheels, lots of them, all kinds of wheels. Fast wheels for action, flashy wheels for show, sporty wheels and speedy wheels for kids on the go. Wheels you can pedal and wheels you can roll, wheels you can ride in, wheels you can tow. Wheels that go and go and so, whenever there's someplace important to go, Hills wheels, lots of them. Look them over at Hills Everyday Low Prices. It's the only way to go. Hills, the anti-inflation department store with low prices every day. Well, in sports, the Pirates were clobbered by the Cards in St. Louis last night. The Buccos went down under the pitching of Jerry Royce. That score was 6-1. to one. Pittsburgh has three more games in St. Louis to recover that loss. We're now in a second-place tie with Philadelphia in the National League East. Pirates will send Terry Forster and Grant Jackson to the mound in a game that gets underway at 9 o'clock tonight. 
You can see that game right here, televised on Channel 2. Well, sports will return to the Cannon McMillan School District. That decision was made last night at a meeting of the Cannon McMillan School Board in Washington County. That reversed a decision made last week to cut sports in the schools to save money. Well, for the first time since 1961, two British women have made it to the single semifinals at the Wimbledon tennis tourney. Virginia Wade made the semis by defeating Rosemary Casals of the United States. Wade meets defending champ Chris Everett tomorrow. The other Briton is Sue Barker, who had a simple time of it with Australia's Carrie Reed. The men take over at Wimbledon today with quarterfinal singles to be scheduled. Well, here's the midday stock report. Market was down during the first hour of trading. The Dow Jones average at 11.30 was down 0.68, standing at 923.42. The volume was 5,570,000 shares traded. The closing market report will be right here on the news at 6 o'clock this evening. And here's the weather forecast for Pittsburgh and vicinity. It comes from the National Weather Service. It's going to be warm and humid today, tonight, and tomorrow with showers and thunderstorms through tomorrow, as if we didn't have enough rain last night. High today in the mid-80s, low tonight in the mid to upper 60s, tomorrow's high in the low 80s. Right now, it's only 68 degrees in downtown Pittsburgh. However, the relative humidity is way up there at 94%. Winds are out of the south at 10 miles an hour, so luckily there's a little breeze with all that humidity. Well, these people are in the news. Carolyn Kennedy's new job as a copy person at the New York Daily News has caused a minor furor. Protesters demonstrated outside the Daily News yesterday and criticized the newspaper for hiring the daughter of the late president at $155 a week while thousands of inner city youths in New York can't find work at all. Band leader Stan Kenton is still in the Reading Medical Center. He's recovering from head surgery. Kenton fractured his skull when he fell in the garage of a Reading motel and struck his head last month. He underwent surgery for the removal of a blood clot. The 65-year-old Kenton is reported to be progressing, but he's still feeling the effects of that surgery. First Lady Rosalind Carter has summer plans that would appeal to quite a few people. According to Mrs. Carter's Deputy Press Secretary, the First Lady hopes to simply take it easy this summer. Mrs. Carter reportedly wants to relax and spend time away from official chores. She's expected to divide her time starting in July between the presidential retreat at Camp David and her home in Plains, Georgia. Mrs. Carter returned Sunday from a trip to the West Coast and to Hawaii. Well, Claude Duvall, a Louisiana state lawmaker, came up with a rather unusual proposal. While his colleagues voted on a measure to make the honeybee Louisiana's official state insect, Duvall suggested that the state adopt infectious mononucleosis as its official disease and strep infection as its official bacteria. Duvall officially and eventually withdrew his proposal. The honeybee measure passed. Next Eyewitness News will be at 6 o'clock this evening. We invite you to stay tuned now for Search for Tomorrow. Bill and Patty Burns are off this week. I'll be back tomorrow. Join us then. Have a good day. Tickets are on sale now for CLO's Broadway musical starting July 12th. Stop by the Heinz Hall box office or call 281-5000. CBS News, London.
Our next news, 6 o'clock this evening. Stay tuned for Search for Tomorrow. Patty is off this week. I'll be back tomorrow at 12. That's the news this noon. If you have a problem and can't get results, call KDKA's Call for Action at 333-9370, weekdays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Cut your cost at Kroger, cut your cost at Kroger. Every day, in every way, cut your cost at Kroger. Kroger grade-A medium eggs are cost-cutter priced at Kroger this week, just 47 cents a dozen. And you'll get whole pork loin, sliced free, for just 99 cents a pound. Kroger is determined to be the low-price leader, so... Cut your cost at Kroger! For super main dish, Ramen Supreme is a better, more delicious noodle from the Oriental East that's winning the West. Ramen Supreme, the best. Buonissimo. Saturday afternoon, Ken Scott stars in the Pirates of Tortuga. Aha! King of the ocean shouldn't leave through a window like a common thief. Go for all that juice. The Pirates of Tortuga, Saturday afternoon at 2 on Action Theater. KDK TV2 Pittsburgh. Hello? Uh, no, hi, Amy. No, I haven't heard from him. Has he talked to you? I'd like to speak to Liza Caslow, please. She's in room 115. That's busy? No, I'll wait. I know, I just thought you said that he was going to come over first thing this morning. Yeah, okay. I know. Okay, thanks for calling. Bye-bye.